Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX14 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new World Warships gameplay today on our channel. In this episode we're setting sail in the tier 5 Japanese heavy cruiser known as the Furutaka, in a tier 6 standard battle on the map ring. Sailing alongside our good friend Z, who I should point out is sailing out in the Texas, the tier 5 premium American battleship, more on that later. The point of today's video is for us to articulate our impressions of the Furutaka and see this as an informal review to accompany our review of the Tier 5 Soviet heavy cruiser known as the Kirov, which we carried out a couple of months ago. Link available to the first part of that in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. Now to provide a synopsis of the Kirov review, we ended up finding it was a ship that with its wonderful 180mm cannon and its rather good speed and ability to fire at long distances, we were able to harass ships at long range and not really get into the centre of the fight until it really mattered towards the end of the game and that was only if needed, otherwise we could just stick to medium to long range. In the Furutaka the story is completely different, at least in my opinion, because whilst you do have 6 8 inch guns mounted in twin turrets by an AVX configuration, two to the front one to the rear, the issue is you don't have the gun range to be able to sit back, and what's more your detectability by sea means that you are caught in this strange trap, now let me explain. When you get the ship fully upgraded and you do not have Concealment Expert on your captain, your detectability by sea will be in the region of 12km. The issue with that is the fact that an enemy destroyer can sit at 9km from you in open seas, as you're going to see here, we're demonstrating what happens when you sit in open seas for a brief period of time, and that destroyer can just sit there and keep you spotted for a long period of time. The net result is they will be spotting you for battleships that are approximately 15 plus kilometers away from you, and they can use the superior gun range and even the superior range on the likes of the Kirov to be able to continuously shell you and you have no means of getting back at them unless you try to either A, rush to the destroy and get it out of the game, B, run for cover as we're now starting to do, or C, you turn 180 degrees and run back to your teammates. Now of course if you're going to turn away it's very likely at some point you'll be targeted on your broadside and armour piercing will go in, and whilst the Furutaka does have some armour, it's not that heavily armoured and as a result you'll start taking citadels. So therefore even when we have Concealment Expert as you're seeing here with a 10.4km detectability by sea and by air 6.2km, the open seas plan is not going to work because we just do not have the range. Instead, we're going to move towards the land masses down the eastern side of the map and move forward towards the southeastern corner. The idea of using cover to make sure we're not shot at as much as compared to our ships are in open waters and are overexposed technically. In the meantime, I'd just like to articulate the reason why it's important that Z is in the Texas in particular. The Texas, for those who don't know, has a very powerful AA suite, and Z is running pretty much a full AA build on it, meaning the tier 5 carrier that we see on the enemy team would be suicidal, in my personal opinion, to put his planes anywhere near myself because I'm within the AA radius, or at least the outer ring, of Z's battleship and that is going to have the factor of dissuading potentially the enemy carrier to engage our fleet down this side of the map over the course of the game. Now the torpedoes on this ship, 10km range, they're rather powerful, and there were the hidden elements because it's something you don't always think about, the fact that you've got 10km torpedoes when you've also got 8 inch guns. But as we're going to see, these torpedoes are rather effective at either ambushing enemy ships, or alternatively taking enemy ships by surprise, particularly destroyers when they decide to sit in their smoke screens at long range, and the enemy gator there is sitting in that smoke screen and using it as a means of stealth firing or smoke firing against our battleships. Now without him using his hydroacoustic, he's not going to know those torpedoes are coming until it's too late, as they're detected at 1.5km by sea as standard when you don't have vigilance, and what with their top speed of 59 knots, and their ability to do a maximum amount of damage of 16,267, they can cause a bit of mayhem. But then we switch to our guns, and what we can see is with our 8 inch guns, when we aim right and get the right amount of lead, using our armour piercing on our broadside in cruiser, it can be a bit of mayhem, as we pick up the torpedo hit on the Gator. Now getting ready to fire on the Kira, if we get the right lead here I hope. And... What we'll see is your armor piercing shells doing a citadel damage of 4,700. They're going to leave a big chunk in your opponent's health pool. And as we turn in underneath the Kirov's armor piercing barrage, we use what armor we have to deflect the shells or cause over penetrations in our superstructure. That's quite tight time in there. But what you can see also is the fact that we have the brilliant rudder shift to be able to deal with situations like that. We we'll have a rudder shift of 5.7 seconds and a turn circle radius of 750 meters, you can shake your booty about quite nicely. 
But on top of that as well, what one has to consider is with a top speed of 34 and a half knots, and look how thin this ship is as well. It's a hard ship to hit as you go out to medium ranges, I say around 10, 11 kilometers. Unless of course, the Furutaka plant is sailing straight broadside. And throwing our shells here on against the MMO we put in, the tier five French cruiser, we aim a little bit too far towards their bow, and as a result, we only get over penetrations, and we'll try to compensate once again for this. But if not, at least we're pushing them away because of the fear factor of our armor piercing going into them. And we pick up a Citadel there, dealing exactly 4,700, and we can see their health pool is evaporating. Now, it's not to say we haven't lost some health ourselves already. And what of the fact we're already down to two thirds of our health, but this is where Adrenaline Rush starts to come in, and that starts to enable you to get around the 15 second reload on your guns, which is a very long reload, and it is the longest, from what I recall, of the tier 5 standard cruisers, i.e., any non premiums. Therefore, the issue you do have is you have to make every salvo count, but on top of that, your guns have wonderful dispersion, and hopefully, you're seeing that throughout the course of this game. The tight clustering of the shells, even when we only fire with the two front guns. The shells just land so close together that when you do hit and score that magical hit, it feels perfect. It's not a case of your shells just lined up because that's what RNG said, it's as though the guns are all working in harmony. Now with the dispersion of being 120 meters at your maximum range, the other thing is to think about the fact that your shells in general are rather powerful. Your high explosive does 3,300 maximum damage and with its 17% fire chance as standard, we're not running Demolition Expert here, we've elected to go with Vigilance instead, more on that in a bit. With that fire chance, you have the ability to frustrate enemy battleships and exhaust them of their fire extinguishers and start cutting into their hills quite early on if you decide to continuously spray high explosive at the enemy battleships, which we're only going to do once the enemy cruisers are out of the way. And here's a Mamance that gives a bit of broadside, and as they're turning full broadside almost, we land some nice chunky hits for our armor piercing, knocking off 10,000 health once again. And what you'll notice, because we're actually quite close to the enemy ships, using our detectability and having to get around our poor gun range in general, it means that getting used to providing ample lead in the Furutaka is not too much of an issue. And the shell velocity is not too bad, both shells coming at an initial muzzle velocity of 840 meters per second. It means that you can very quickly get used to these guns, and therefore start to feel comfortable. One thing you do need to keep in mind is that the turret rotation speed, and we are running expert marksmen here, is absolutely atrocious, but this is a commonality of the Japanese cruiser line from what my colleagues have told me. Whereby to turn 180 degrees with these guns, it's going to take 26.9 seconds with expert marksmen. That's a long time, and therefore you're going to have to start to think like a battleship when sailing the ship to an extent, making sure your guns are pointing in the right direction for the next engagement well in advance. Now in pursuing the enemy Koenig and also noting the Iron Duke off to what is our port side, we're going to angle to try and tank shells from both ships if needs be, as we're being targeted by three ships, priority target 10 less that so. What we can see is shifting to high explosive, our role now is just to simply sap away at the health of these enemy ships and start to set the fires we were talking about earlier. We're not going to be too successful in this regard today, but we can't always have luck on our side. In moving forward and having set our first fire on the enemy Koenig, who's going to put it out rather quickly, we now start to make our way towards another smokescreen that the enemy Gator has set up, and now I'll explain why I'm running Vigilance. The Hydroacoustic Search Consumable, which this ship has, has a range of spotting torps of 2.67 km and a detectability for ships of 3.72 km. With Vigilance, your detection of torpedoes will go out to approximately 3.4 km with a 25% boost, because Vigilance stacks on top of the Hydroacoustic Search. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to see ships in their smoke screens at pretty much the same time as I'm going to see the torpedoes come out of the smoke screens. It's not an optimum build perhaps compared to what other people would say, but it means that I have the ability to be much more aggressive in pushing smoke screens. And here I actually make a bit of a player mistake of throwing my torpedoes down without consulting our friendly Fabuki to make sure they weren't going to drift into line of them. Fortunately they've reacted to seeing them come off of our ship, but if they hadn't reacted to that, it could have been a team kill, and that would be entirely my fault. I accept full responsibility for this mistake. Now, if our torpedoes down once again, what this is going to do is force the Gator to come out of the smoke, and if they still sat in there, we would have spotted them off of the hydroacoustic search considerable very shortly. And our catapult fighter is up as well to be able to spot around the smoke if the planes rotate in that direction at the given point in time. But unfortunately, they're actually behind us at the moment and coming around in a counterclockwise rotation. And with the Gator essentially forced on a straight path of our torpedoes, them having to dodge them, we can gradually start to sap into their health pool. Our secondaries are open fire as well, nothing to really talk about of our secondaries, they're not too great. And coming back to the AA of this ship, because we did briefly mention 
The zine is Texas providing us with AA support as we pick up the destroyer kill. The maximum range of your AA is 4.5 kilometers without an AA build or advanced firing training on your captain skill. Your 4.5 kilometer AA will do 20 damage per second. Then your mid range is 3.1 kilometers doing another 20 damage per second. And then your inner ring, seven damage per second, 1.2 kilometers. You have very poor AA compared to what some ships may have at the tier. Therefore, Sitting close to ships with greater AA suites such as Z's battleship will be advantageous and whilst Z has drifted very far back because he took a lot of pressure in the opening stages of the game we can see now that the lack of carrier threat down this side of the map is not going to undermine us in this extent. So it's particularly in the opening stages of the game where it's a carrier game, say tier 6 or tier 7 carriers, sticking close to AA ships such as the tier 6 American cruiser the Cleveland will help you out in the long haul and always retreat back to friendly AA ships when needs be. Or if your teammates are running carriers, or if you particularly got a squadron mate who's running the carrier and they decide to bring their fighters over, head towards the fighters because that'll be a good sense of security. Now in tossing our shells over the landmass in front of us to hit the Iron Duke, what we can see is that these shell arcs of our guns are not too bad. They're not floaty American arcs, but at the same time they're not railgun Russian arcs. They're an in-between, which means that we can shoot over small landmasses with relative ease and gradually help to whittle down the health state of the Iron Duke, who's going to be left on an agonising amount of health. 154, meaning we didn't get the kill, but instead our Nuremberg does, and we now move towards the cap. Outside this, we'll quickly come back to the torpedoes and note that you have two quadruple sets, one to each side of the ship, and the firing angles are not too bad compared to what you'll be experiencing later on as you go up the Japanese line, particularly with the Alba and then the Miyoko, whereby from what I recall, particularly the next ship, the tier 6 Alba, the torpedo angles are towards the rear of the ship. Here you have torpedo angles that are down the side of the ship, but you have a more limited forward arc than perhaps you would like. But you can get around that as we've seen by angling quite a bit, and then using your rudder shift to re-angle your ship to the point you won't get penetrated by armor piercing shells. And it's paid off with our torpedoes being used as a means of pushing the enemy destroyer out of their smoke or dealing damage to them whilst they're in their smoke. And you can also use your torpedoes for a number of other things, ambushing for essentially ambushing enemy ships around corners, or alternatively catching battleships in open water by surprise because they may not anticipate you to have 10 km torps. The only other thing to really note here is we make our way towards the enemy Bogue, and we're going to try and throw some shells in towards them as well, is that this ship, with its very limited profile, can lead to you feeling a little bit overconfident because you'll start to think to yourself, well nobody can hit me because look how thin I am. One thing to notice, you do not have the armour to be able to bow tank effectively in this ship, and if, particularly if you're in a tier 7 game where the guns start going up to a calibre of 406mm and the likes of the Colorado, or 16 inches, you're going to get ripped apart if you get hit on the bow by those ships, unless you effectively angle. So you can't get away with just simply sailing straight to the enemy. And you'll note that every time we've been shot at or targeted by some, we've continuously changed direction to try and get some angling in and alternatively dodge the shells. We do not want to get hit wherever possible. Now one question you could ask at this point, with all this change of direction, as we pick up a high explosive citadel on the bow and set them on fire, with all this change of direction and swinging back and forth, is there any value in bringing the third turret, i.e. the X turret on the rear of the ship, to bear in a given situation? Yes, there is, particularly if you're in a situation where it's a one versus one and you feel that you can catch your opponent out in terms of your reload, i.e. that your guns are going to be ready and you're not going to be held up by the 15 second reload on the guns. You'll be able to do a lot of damage because you do have eight inch guns at the end of the day and you technically have what I recall the biggest guns for a cruiser at your tier, which is a key asset in your favour. But with that, I think that's all the sort of statistics and the points raised here, as this game really just wraps up with us capturing the flag. There's nothing else to talk about. There's an enemy Queen Elizabeth in our cap who's just been eliminated by our Bayern, and we can see that the enemy Fuso's all the way up in the northeastern corner of the map, and the enemy Koenig has drifted off all the way into the northwestern corner, and the enemy carries out the game. So there's no other threats around, and nothing we can get to, despite our wonderful top speed of 34 and a half knots. So with that we're just going to park up and look into the sun and just look upon the horizon. Time to take a look at the post game stats. A rather comfortable victory for our team in the end, we can see that our battle performance amounted to a grand total of 65,747 HP of damage. 
Coming on to the team scores, we can see that we topped our team in terms of base experience earned, picking up 1,607. We can attribute this to the fact that we were a forward presence on our team once we started to make our way along the land masses down the eastern side of the map, and we were able to put to good use both our torpedoes and our 8 inch guns, doing significant damage to the enemy cruisers in particular, and providing assistance damage in terms of the high explosive shells we dropped on the enemy battleships and the eventual fires that we did set. And whilst those fires were put out, we could say they exposed the enemy battleships to potentially more fires or flooding from our carrier, for example, and therefore put the enemy battleships at a greater risk of being sunk. We felt that we had a presence throughout the game, not a massive one, not one whereby we could carry the team effectively, but instead just one in which we continuously contributed to the match rather than having a lull in which we didn't do anything down the eastern side of the map as we rotated around towards the enemy capture point. And like all the other replays I've featured on this channel, we can see that finally, Z did actually do something useful. Although in his AA build Texas, he didn't shoot down a single plane. Coming on to our detailed report, we have one key item to note here. And that is, if we look at our main battery damage caused, we can see that the shells that we hit with, we did significantly more armor piercing damage than we did high explosive damage. Even when you add the fire damage to the high explosive tally, because I would consider that all to be high explosive damage and all. 50% more damage was dealt with our armor piercing shells in this comparison, and this goes to demonstrate how with your 15 second reload, you need to make your shell choice count when it matters, as you can do a lot more damage with your armor piercing when an opponent gives you broadside than you can with your high explosive and in some instances you'll be wanting to use your high explosive to do significant damage and set fires as we saw with the battleships towards the end of the game as they tried to run away back towards the southwestern corner of the map. Meanwhile, armor piercing earlier on in the game proved very fruitful against the broadsides of the enemy cruisers. And finally, coming on to our credits and experience earned, we can see that after additions and deductions, we walked away with a total of 177,868 silver credits and 2,484 commander experience. To conclude, hopefully today we've witnessed the potency of the Furutaka in a given World of Warships match, whereby compared to her Soviet counterpart at Tier 5, the Kirov, she cannot sit back and continuously rain down fire on her foes, as she does not have the gun range to do so. Instead, she needs to avoid open water and use her speed and rudder shift to get close to land masses and close the distance to the enemy team. Of course, making sure not to overextend away from her fleet, but once she gets close enough to the enemy team, she's able to use her torpedoes to flush enemy ships out of smoke screens or ambush them round corners, and also use her guns to maximum effect, making sure to have the right shell loads at the right time so that way you can achieve maximum possible damage rather than much less than what you perhaps hoped for. Therefore, this combination of firepower and maneuverability is why I would like to refer to the Furutaka as the Portable Punch. With that, I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment, or subscribe for future World of Warships videos on my channel. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and fair seas.